Richard, how are you going? Good. Mate, good to be here. How good is this? What about your little studio oh, here? Hi. I love it. Yeah, it's good. It's beautiful. Not as good as yours. Um, you've, You're an OG podcaster. 12 years you're just saying you've been doing the Richmond podcast. Yeah, we started a podcast at Richmond, Talking Tigers. I reckon it was in 2012 was our first year. Didn't know where it was going. Didn't know what we were doing. You know, podcasting was 12 years. just That's probably a lot, starting. Long yeah. time ago. So, yeah, we just started doing it every Tuesday and we're still doing it now and we okay, love good. it. We yeah. love the ticks. Um, mate, it's an honour to have you in today. I was thinking, I was rattling my brain about like I always like to say this type like where I first met the person, where it would be. And I don't think you would remember this, but I actually met you in like I reckon 2017. Oh, no, it would have been 20. 2018, I reckon. Yeah. When I left the Giants, I went and worked as a producer at 3AW. Yes. As like, I was working on like DD's afternoon show. Right. I never actually worked on a show with you, but yeah. I just remember one day you walked in and you were doing like the footy. Yeah. Well, I've been at AW now for, geez, time flies still. I started in 2010 and mm. I'm still there now. So, yeah, really enjoying it. Really lucky to still have the jobs in footy and... Yeah, 3RW has been a good place for me to work. I really enjoy it there. Yeah, they've got a good um, a good crew there. So it's like once you're in, you're, you're in. They've yeah, and I think, tight knit. I think so. And I think it's a bit of an older crowd, obviously, that listen to 3RW. So for me, I'll look at it as probably some longevity there. I've got yeah. three daughters now. I've got to pay some school yeah. fees coming up, Dill. So, <laughs> yeah, so I'm enjoying working there and yeah, it's a good workplace for me. Um, I'm sure you listen to Tom Elliott as, as everyone does on 3RW. For maybe the listeners not knowing, they might not know Tom but he's an OG in, in the radio game. And I used to have to do this segment with him. It was yeah. called, I can't even remember, but it was like something to do with like young versus old. Yeah. And they used to sort of stitch me up each week and I would have to like say something that would just rattle up like the older yeah. generation. Yeah. And I remember one week, and this isn't funny, but like, and I wish I sort of in hindsight knew what I was saying because I learned never say something unless you agree with it. Right. And they made me say this segment saying that when COVID comes back, all the jobs should be given to all the young people instead of the old people. <laughs> and you can imagine the crowd like – Yeah. It, I was getting like full on like death threats yeah. like through Twitter and like people that like, went on the podcast were like leaving reviews. I was like, what the fuck? So well, they absolutely stitched me. Well, you know what? All those older people now, they'd be able to get a job because everywhere I go in Melbourne now post-COVID, there's staff shortages everywhere. Yeah, there you there's go. There's jobs going for everyone. So maybe I actually did a – Good thing for yeah, him. maybe. And you don't don't have to be young, old. <laughs> anyone can get a job. If you want to work now, you should be able to get a job. Hundred, especially in hospitality. Yeah, absolutely. Everywhere. Hey, um, mate, let's jump into you. And one thing I do love about yourself as well that we we're just talking about off air. I'm so sick of ex footballers and sports people. As soon as sort of like they're done, they finish up and they head straight south side. I think you and I, and I'll give you the the king. I might be the prince of this, but north side is for life. And it needs a bit more respect where the yeah. game is. But I sort of like it. It's a bit more quiet on our side. We do what we want. We're not about the showbiz. Yeah. It's, just, it's a nice bunch of people. Well, I have probably I probably did both, Deal. Like I, when I first got to Melbourne, I lived out in Vermont South yeah. with some family friends for 18 months. And I loved it because I settled into Melbourne. Mm. But once I found my feet, I always wanted to get north side. That's where I felt at home. And I lived in Carlton for years. Beautiful. I lived in Fitzroy. But then at one point I was – sort of my late 20s, I was living right behind the Bull Ring, which was on Johnson Street, which yep. was an old Spanish nightclub okay. next to the Provincial Hotel. Yep. I think it's a supermarket now, as as most things <laughs> fall by the wayside. I think Coles or Woolies have got it now. But uh, I lived right behind the Bull Ring in Fitzroy and I was still playing and every Saturday night that bass was just boom, boom, boom. <laughs> I couldn't sleep. like So I was going to games of footy on no sleep and I thought, I need a change. So I went down to Elwood. Oh, you which did? if you're going to live south yeah, side, it is, it is, I feel like yeah. Elwood's the suburb, don't you I'll, reckon? I will let that one pass. Yeah. Like my sister and uh, you know, partner live in Elwood. It is beautiful. Yeah. But it gets any further than that, yeah. it's a bit yuppy. Well, there's nothing to do. Yeah. You, you're bored out of your brain. So yeah. I lived in Elwood and I had about nine years there, but I always felt drawn back to the north. So three years ago, we bought a house in Northcote and moved Beautiful. back and, yeah, I won't be going back now. Yeah, three or seven. It's like no. the Berlin Wall, the Yarra River. It is. It's, uh, I don't know, it's something about it. Good people, good community. It's fantastic. And that um, shows your roots too because I, I don't want to fanboy you too much, but I love your sort of living arrangements and by, not by choice, but even like being a Tasmanian. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you're a big listener of the show, but I'm seriously the number one ticket holder of Tasmania. For, yeah. for, for someone that's not from Tassie, 
It's probably my favourite place in Australia. Yeah, oh, I was down there on Monday in Launceston and every time I go back there, I couldn't wait to move away from yeah. Tassie when I was a kid because I wanted to get to Melbourne. I wanted to get here and play AFL footy in the big smoke and I've loved every minute of it but whenever ever I go home now, I feel more drawn back yeah. to it and it's just kicking goals, Tassie. So if, you want a, if you want a week away, you go down there, grab a car or, or do whatever you want to do but um, you need more than a week probably but, yeah... It's really – it's a great place to go for if you want to do a foodie sort of weekend, yeah. go and experience some great cuisine. You know, if you want to go walking, get out in the wildlife, there's, there's plenty of that as well. Give it's us, got something yeah. for everyone. Give us your th- sort of tips of like where you'd go in Tassie. If you're sending someone away, your top three or four establishments that you'd send them to, where would you, where would you go? As far as towns or – Anywhere, like anything right. you like doing. Because I, I went to a pub over there once, a club. I think it was called oh, – you go first, it'll come back to me. Well, I'm from Devonport, the yep. northwest coast, which yep. probably gets ignored because people go to Tassie, they go to Launceston, they go to Hobart, they go down the east coast and do all that sort of stuff. But look, I'm from the northwest coast, so for me, you've got to experience that as well. So check out Devonport. If you go down on the boat, don't get off the boat in your car and just drive straight to Launceston. Yep. Actually hang around, have a look at the northwest coast, which is where I'm from. Mm. Um, plenty of things to do there. Then you go down to Launceston, go up to the Tamar Valley and do all the wineries up around there. Mm. Do you like golf? You're a golfer, I'm, aren't you? I'm a terrible. I love golf. Yeah. I went to um, Bumbergle recently. You've got to do that. You've got to. I mean, that is just amazing. Yeah. I'm not even a good golfer, but you go up there just to have a look around. The right? beach, I've never seen a coastline actually quite like yeah. it. It looks fake. It looks yeah. genuinely fake. Yeah, so the Bridport Distillery too. Yeah, yeah. got a new distillery yeah. there. It's very cool. So do all that, and then obviously probably drive down the east coast. And I mean, there's there's so many great places now. And then into Hobart, and mm. probably you spend probably three or four days in in Hobart. And there's, you know, all you got to do is walk in Hobart. You just get yeah. get get out your walking shoes and walk around, and you'll find something to do pretty quickly. I'm sure um, you would have got in this area early, but Battery Point when I was there, yes, he's like. I couldn't believe how beautiful it was. Yeah. Like the houses and the pubs and it's a everything. great little pub great up little there. Pub. Yeah. Shipwright's arms, is it? I, well, I yeah. think it, and they have like the little wooden handles. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. unbelievable. Anyway, that's for Tasmania. Um, shout out to them if they're listening. Should we have a team? Oh, I reckon hundred percent. Yeah. Hundred yeah. percent. And and what this whole thing around like people saying, um, North versus South. I don't think it's really a thing. As soon as there was a team there, they'd, they'd all just band around. I'm yeah. sure. Look, it, it's, it's a little bit of a thing if you you live there and you just you, if you live up north on the northwest coast, you probably haven't got a lot of reason to go down to Hobart. Yeah. But give it a reason, and they and they will. Are right? they saying though that they'd rotate the games, or they uh, have to be stuff in Hobart? I think there would be a few games in Launceston, and but if they build this new stadium in Hobart, predominantly you would be based there. Yeah. But. You know, if you build it, they'll come, and I think that's what will happen yep. with the Tassie AFL team. People in Devonport, up in Burnie, they'll travel down for their own team. They're not going to travel down there to watch North, with all due respect to North Melbourne yeah. and, and whoever else is playing down there. Um, they're not going to drive three hours. If you're not a North Melbourne supporter, they're not going to drive three hours to no. see. They'll drive three hours for their own team, though, Yeah. so it's time. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited. Hopefully something happens there. Um, Look at the jumping jacks. Yeah, done exactly. It. It's, it's, it's unreal. Um, mate, let's get into your story. As much as I'd love to talk about Tassie all day. Um, father-son pick yep. to the Tigers. How did it all come about? Yeah, so I was a Richmond supporter, Dill, probably like you were obviously mm. a Carlton man following your dad and I was the same following my old man who played at Richmond in the 60s. So um, I never saw him play. He retired the year that I was born, 1975, but he'd moved down to Tassie by this point. Um but I knew he played for Richmond growing up. Clearly, I, I followed Richmond. Mm. The year I really probably discovered them was 1980 when they beat Collingwood in the grand final. And I remember that day, it all sort of clicked, right? This is the best team. We're smashing Collingwood, this team that everyone seems to not like. And my dad played for them. So I thought, this is it. You know, this is the team for me. So, yeah, I was a mad Richmond supporter. We made the granny again in 82 mm. and Carlton beat us. Should have won. We were mad favourites. Um Helen Dimenko, the stripper, come out on yep. the ground. Yep. And uh, that was the end of the Tigers, I think. So, yeah, we lost that year. And then, you know, we're in the wilderness for a lot of years there, the Tigers. But I, I was a passionate supporter, a Nuffy Richmond supporter. And, yeah, at the end of 1992, I got the opportunity to come over, Father Son Rule, which was great. You know, I was already over here before the draft even happened because back then you just got added to the list. Right. You didn't even go through the draft process. Now the father sons do. So you're already just training. I was already team. here. Yeah. yeah. So I knew I was coming. I signed up around 22, 1992. I actually came over here and watched Richmond play the Adelaide Crows. 
um, at the G. They got pumped by 10 goals and I signed up straight after that game, signed a four-year deal and yeah. moved over probably three or four weeks later. Unbelievable. What were you like when you first came over, being a young young kid, obviously moving into state? Yeah. Were you quiet? Were you up and about? Like how was nah, it? Pretty quiet. Yeah, I was pretty determined to go well. Yeah. Like I had a fierce desire, I guess you'd say. So I trained hard. Um, you know, that was something I prided myself on. You know, I always tried to train harder than, than everyone else. So, yeah, trained hard, played on the weekend, but – we had to work full time then, Dill, in between. So yeah. I worked um, for MLC Insurance in the city. Wow. Yeah. So up at, lived in Vermont, up at 7 a.m., driving down the Burwood Highway into the city, worked eight till four, in the car, off to Punt Road, trained, wouldn't get back to Vermont till nine o'clock at night. What so were you doing? What sort just of? Just office clericals. Sort of yeah. <laughs> was that a job? Was it a making, real. Making coffee. Yeah. Sort of, it was a real job. Was it like, were yeah. you in that sort of field or was it like sort of someone from the club no, sort of pushed just you into a, it? was just a job that they found for me um definitely not something i was into yeah. selling insurance <laughs> but i was just more an office boy really doing the mail so i'd be doing mail making coffees monday to friday and then playing on the mcg saturday and that's what it was like it was semi-professional yeah but i just had my head down and went to training and went home yeah Fucking hell. what well, was like the early because this is something that i think when you leave footy and people might have you know people got a, a lot more memory of you than they do of me but someone will come up to me and sort of be like, oh, did you play with Brendan Favola? Like, what was yeah. it like? I was like, yeah. he fucking retired like seven years before <laughs> I was even there. Who were some of the guys that were like the older crew when yeah. you first got in? Yeah, well, the biggest the biggest name was a guy called Dar Waitman, the flea, yep. who would have played against your dad. Yep. Uh, I idolised the flea as a kid. So I then rolled up there and he's still playing. So that his last year was my first year, 1993. So I got to play a few games with him. He was injured most of the year, but that was surreal. You know, you walk into the change rooms and, you know, I've had his number on my back, number three, and then mm. all of a sudden I'm playing with him. So, yeah, he was the biggest name. Then there were, there were younger guys that were were good players, like Matthew Knights, you know, I'd like, I'd idolised him. Brendan Gale, who's the CEO now. Um, he was someone I looked up to because he was from the northwest coast of Tassie as well. Similar position, we're both big guys, so... I looked up to him. So, yeah, had some good sort of role models in my first couple of years. Was it like sort of coming into a team like that as a big boy? I can imagine there's always like some older guys that you're competing against for yeah. like those positions and it does get super competitive. Yeah. Like it does, you know, it does temper over. Was there anyone that sort of tested you early days? How did you respond to it? Like when I knew, I knew when I was a young player and young players now are so better – um, like equipped to deal with this yeah. and they don't they really don't care that it's like fuck this is my position yeah. but I sort of just like laid over I was like oh, okay I'll wait I'll yeah, wait right. you know I'll, I'll, how was it for you it was probably the bit of the opposite yeah I was really shitty I didn't play in round one wow like I, I thought I'd done enough in the practice matches we weren't a great team you got to remember that we're coming from the bottom right and we we had some players that you know I thought I was probably better than straight away that were getting a game in yeah. front of me and I remember when the team came out for round one and I didn't get selected. I couldn't believe I was filthy, right? I thought I should have been in the team. So I might have been ahead of myself. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It probably was. Um, but I thought I should have been in the team. So they made me wait six weeks and I came in in round seven. But, yeah, it, it, that really annoyed me. I remember sitting there after the reserves played because we played before the seniors, right? We played the Crows again. We played them last, in, last round of uh, 92, first round of 93. And I played in the twos and then... A few of our twos guys were up. There was a little bar in between the old member stand and the northern stand. It was like a tucked away little bar. And a few of our guys were up there having a few pots, right? And I'm thinking, what, what's going on here? This didn't happen in Tassie. Like I played a year at Devonport in the seniors. We didn't drink pots after the twos before the ones in Tassie. So that annoyed me as well. I thought, are we professional enough yeah, wow. here? So, yeah, I thought oh, no, I want to get out of this environment, you know, and get into the ones. I don't want to be drink, sitting here drinking pots before the seniors. So. What did you do? Like when you – did you just go back and try put your head down, bum up, or did you have like comments? Did you yeah, hit people no, up? Yeah, just – obviously there were conversations with the coach and he just said, look, you've got to earn your stripes a little bit, which I thought I then did over the next sort of five or six yeah. rounds. Played pr pretty well in the twos and got my chance in round seven. So, yeah, probably a little bit the opposite. I didn't want to – just give up a spot. I wanted to play straight away. Yeah, well, that's it, it's proven that's the way it's got yeah, to be. Like, yeah. I think you look at guys, and I, I remember coming in now, a guy that really stands out to me was the guy Sam Taylor who plays at the Giants. Yeah, star. Star. Yeah. And he came in 
And I think I still probably had that old, what was ri- driven into me as like a young bloke, like you earn your stripes, mate, yeah. go on, you can't do this. And, you know, I, I admit like I was like, shut up. And he was just like, no, fuck this, yeah. I'm playing. And he yeah. did. Like, yeah. that's the way all these... And that's what they do now. you got to. you got to. Look at Sam Walsh, you know. Exactly. Like, it's like he played 200 games in his first few games. I couldn't believe it. And that's how these guys come in now. So I think I had a similar attitude to that probably, yeah. you got to. You yeah, got I to. think you do. Um, early season, like what was some memories of first getting in? Like is there any big learnings in your first few games? Yeah, well, I played in my first game and I was I was just down at um, Moorabbin this morning. They've got um, the Danny Frawley Centre down yep. there. Danny was a coach of mine and... He's got uh, he's got his tribute game coming up in a few weeks, Spuds game. So I was down there today, doing a few things, and it just reminded me that I played on Danny in my first game. We played St Kilda um, at the G round seven ninety three, and I played on Danny for a period of uh, that game. And another guy called Jamie Shanahan, and I looked at these guys, and I was probably one ninety six. I would have been about eighty eight, eighty nine kilos. So I was really light on, and. Um, I looked at Danny and it was the first thing I remember when I looked at him, like he was just thick. You know, you yeah. look at someone's side yeah. on and he just had that big chest and the big ass. and I thought, cross, I've got a bit of work to do here if I'm going to be able to compete physically with these guys. Um, so I guess I used my strengths around my running ability in my first couple of years, but that was the thing that I sort of learned pretty quick. I've got to put some size on here. Mm. If I want to be a key position player, I've got to get in the weight room, which I'd never done before. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, that was embarrassing, to be honest. What was embarrassing about just not knowing what well, you're doing? Like, just couldn't lift the weight. Like, yeah. what, what do we warm up on? 60 kilos? You yeah. know, the 20-kilo plates in the bar was 60. And that yeah. was generally just your warm-up weight. I couldn't lift that once. Wow. And I remember distinctly sitting there with our reserves coach, Peter Schwab, the former Hawthorne champ, and he said, oh, we'll do a bit of bench press. And he's done the warm-up with the 60, and I've got it off and got it down. I couldn't get it up. And Schwab, he had to lift it up. So. Oh. I thought, man, I've got some work to do here. So, yeah, that was probably my first lesson out of my first few games. Did anyone, like, was this all sort of self-intuitive or did someone take you under their wing? Was there someone pushing you to do these uh, things? No, I got told pretty early days, just pick out the best trainers and you'll know who they are pretty mm. quickly. So when I first got to the Richmond, I, I realised Craig Lambert was probably, you'd know Lambie. Yeah, yeah, yeah from yeah, Giants. Lambie yeah. was a hard trainer. Uh, so I followed him. Wayne Campbell was another one. Matty Knights was another one. So just get him around those guys and follow what they do. So you work out pretty quickly the guys that are, are disciplined and, and train hard and that, that's what I tried to do. I know you said like earlier with this and it doesn't surprise me that you you know you felt like you deserved at the level and, and you wanted to come in and dominate and be the best you could be. But was there a time early in your career, it might have been first year, second year, third year in where you, you sort of had a game or a moment where you're like, fuck, I can, yeah, I can really dominate this? Um, yeah, there was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to pump myself Mate, up. Mate, you've got to. Right? You've got to. It's, it, this, you, you're allowed to. But it was it. pretty early. Yeah. It was my fourth game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a wanker. Oh, I love it. I love it. It was my fourth game and we <laughs> played the Swans at the G. And I don't know, I just all clicked that day yeah. and I kicked six and I thought, Shit, I can I can play at this level. So, yeah. yeah, I don't know that day. It's just one of them days. Everything went right, you know. Every time I went for a mark, it just seemed to stick in my hands. And you know, Fluke kicked a couple of goals I probably wouldn't have normally kicked, and I got off the ground. You know, and it was probably in a zone a bit. Everything just went right, and yeah, I got off the ground that day. And that I probably went home that night and thought, oh, I think I can compete at the level. That's what it takes. Yeah. So, like, well, I. Can't say I've ever had one of those games before. <laughs> not especially not in my in my fourth, but I think at Neeful sometimes, you know, I was just like playing on sixteen year olds going, yeah. I can yeah. beat these young guys. Yeah. You know? That's yeah. what it feels like. You're in the zone. You're in the zone. It's flow state. I say it now, I reckon you only get in the zone if you're a good, you know, a good player, you get you might get in the zone two or three times for the year. Mm. And then you're still a good player the rest of the year, but yeah, just have a game and um you know, I saw Charlie Kernow the other night when he at, at Mar- he was in the zone. He gets in the zone, you know, a bit. He's a player that can yeah. get in it, and he might get in it four or five times a year. But yeah, I found that day that was the first time I felt like you know whatever I did was going to go right. How did you like with it being a big forward kicking goals? Obviously, kicked you know eight hundred goals, eight thousand goals, eight hundred. <laughs> so I don't know why I said eight thousand. <laughs> um, you get in these positions where 
like it's especially playing in a team where you're not scoring a lot of the time, it can yeah. get lonely. Like yeah. you know, you can really get yourself out of the game. Like so yeah. you can struggle to play forward. It's it's easily hands down the hardest position yeah. on the ground to play. It's the How hardest, did, but it's then the best. You know, it, yes, it is the best if things are going yeah. your if way. You're going your way. If you're going, yeah. if you're in that state. Um, how did you keep yourself in that? Like, was there was it just work rate? Was it things you did? Yeah, like, work you, rate. Mm. It's no secret, yeah. you know. I mean, if I if any young footballer came to me now and said, "What have I got to do?" Well, you just got to work hard, you know. And you can think you're working hard, but then you're really working hard. And some guys think they're working hard, but they don't really know how to push through and and get to that next level. So. You've just got to develop a work rate, a training, you know, a training capability to be able to, you know, train hard to get your fitness levels up to where mm. they need to be. And it's not easy, you know, it's hard work. You got, you do have to sacrifice. Um, but I base my game away around work rate as a key forward, get to as many contests as I could. You know, if I got to 20 contests, I might take seven or eight marks. So I got to 30, I might, might take 10 or 12 marks, you know. So that was the way I looked at it. Um, it was pretty simple. If I, and, and don't complicate your game. If you can base it around one or two things, I think that's probably the way to go. I think if you start putting too much into your mind, you start complicating how you're thinking and then you just end up doing nothing probably. Yeah. Um, so that's how I looked at it. What about um, back early in your career? Like the, I'm assuming there wasn't GPSs and you weren't tracking how yeah. far you were running. Yeah. We later on, clue. later on, did it come in? Yeah, it did, but I, I really, I pro couldn't even tell you. Yeah, you know, it wasn't because it wasn't a real focus. You know, you didn't come off the ground and look at your GPS numbers. They did. We did have GPS the last few years, but it was just never. I knew if I'd worked hard, I didn't need yeah. to look at a computer reading to tell me that I had. You just knew whether you had or not. Mm. So, yeah, I, you probably and you probably ran more back in those days. I think because there was less interchange. You're out there all day. Like I never came off the ground really yeah. unless I was injured. Yeah. Um, you're out there all day, less interchange, and the game wasn't as well structured as what it is now. So you probably did a lot of unrewarded running, probably running to the wrong spots, whereas now I think the guys are that well drilled. They don't do as much of that sort of running perhaps. So, yeah, we, we probably ran a little bit more. We probably ran longer, but we didn't run faster. Mm. So we might have done more kilometres but not the velocity that – just that aerobic all day. Yeah, yeah, just the guys now, they're sprinting the whole time they're out there really, aren't they? Mm. Whereas we were just sort of more long distance running, I suppose. Um, something I'd, I'd love to know now, and, and you know, you're in the game, you keep up with, with all the news, you know, you, you're obviously a massive Richmond supporter, you understand what they do. And in the modern game, mindset, mindfulness, all this stuff yeah. is just it's second nature now. It's like you nearly have to do this before you even play footy. Yeah. Was that ever something that crossed your mind when you were playing footy or even like doing it without even knowing you were doing yeah. it? Like do you look back now and go, fuck, maybe I was doing this while I was playing? Yeah, probably definitely not early days yeah. because it was, you know, you just did what you were told and that would have been nonsense probably. There would have been guys yeah. that were doing it and they would have been, you know, people that thought a little bit differently but there was never any meditation or mindfulness stuff, definitely not in my first probably 10 or so years of playing definitely towards the end um i actually did my own leadership course when i was 29 i got to a point where i reckon i'd stagnated as a player mm. i wasn't sort of doing what i wanted to do or probably wasn't getting the respect i thought i should have been getting but it was my own fault really um i went and did a course where i sat down with a guy once a week for you know six months and we just sit there and talk and a lot of that was based around mindfulness and just being calmer and all that sort of stuff. And I played better footy probably in my last five years. I was way more consistent and played good footy. So yeah, it definitely helped. What did you learn in it? Like what were the key factors? What did you I have Just to probably on? being in the moment more, being calm and not worrying about what everyone else thought of me. I probably used to worry about what was written in the newspaper. Really? You know, I'd get online and I'd be looking at forums and reading nonsense from Johnny Smith down the road let it get inside my head you know i wanted to probably please too many people um so when i learned to block that out and just focus on what really actually mattered and just be a bit calmer about my thought process and all of that sort of thing i was probably playing angry all the time you know and that wasn't playing that well because of it so yeah once i got that under control and my mind under control i just played so much better and i really wish i had done it a lot earlier you know it's crazy like perception versus reality yeah. isn't it because yeah. like you look at you know me growing up watching you play, I wouldn't have thought that you would have cared what anyone would ever think. Yeah, no, too much. Yeah, too much. Like I was looking at big footy and stuff like that. This was before right. Twitter, yeah. right? So yeah. that was probably where you found those sort of comments. I went looking for them almost. It was like ridiculous. 
Did, yeah. did you find that it, like, mo- did you do it for motivation? It, I, or were yeah, you at times probably. But I did it also to probably get a bit of gratification, right? To get a little bit of reinforcement, yeah. a bit of positive reinforcement. So if I had a good game, I'd be looking at it. Yeah. I'd be reading all the good comments, but then if I had a bad game, I'd be reading them as well. So it was probably a bit of ego involved as well. Yeah, no, I can um, I can definitely relate with that. We I speak about this a lot, like with the pod and like even yeah. things I'm doing now, which is actually almost for me it's harder than when I was playing footy because yeah. the footy was like a perception of who I was, whereas yeah. the pod is that it actually is sort of like me. Yeah. So if people don't like me, you actually do take yeah. it quite personally. Yeah. But. I've found that like well, people want to be like. Let's be honest. We do. You're lying if, and I, I always love it when a footballer or someone says, oh, "I don't read the paper. I don't. I don't care." <sighs> that that screams to me. You read it even more than you do. Yeah, yeah People care. You might be some unique individual that doesn't, but I think most people do care a little bit about mm. what's said about them. Yeah. Did you? Well, did you have any strategies around it? Like, what was what was like the messaging around not caring? Not not caring, but not probably looking forward or well not. just understanding that it didn't really probably matter what john mm. johnny down the road thought you know who, who did who does it matter who actually matters and i had to work out yeah. who those people were and it was a pretty small group really it was my coaches my teammates and a few people a few loved ones that you know obviously i care what they were thinking yeah i love it i've got one for you who's your favorite um i know you're a metalhead yeah who's your favorite artist oh jeez. That's a tough one. Well, probably bands I've enjoyed the most in recent times are like bands like At The Drive-In, Queens of the Stone Age. Okay. Mm. So say I don't like them. Yeah. Does it make you like them any less? No. Exactly. No. So that was like, we, we speak about this a lot, but it's, it's, it's a way that I fathomed it a lot as well. It's like yeah. just because someone doesn't like me doesn't mean that other people are going to hate me as well. It yeah. doesn't change the picture yeah. of who you like or no, what happens. Exactly. Um, but yeah, you can tell I've definitely gone into that i don't read any reviews anymore yeah like and i don't find that i actually try and avoid the good ones more because that softens me a bit yeah. <laughs> you think you're killing it you think you're absolutely dominating tell me can you watch your own podcast back how do you i go? don't yeah so i think that it's a strength and a weakness in a way yeah and to be honest one of the biggest things i regret most about my footy i don't really regret anything but the one thing i probably wish i did a bit better was i would avoid ever going and doing my vision with a coach right, never right. i'd never watch myself play yeah right because i just hate that i don't know i just hate yeah. it even if i played well i didn't, I didn't want to do yeah, it yeah. which wasn't as that, that often but yeah. i hated seeing myself play i hated that feedback I hated the review so yeah. it's just something that i'm not yeah. i was never really too keen on yeah yeah i no, i was probably i didn't mind watching the tapes because i wanted to see how i could get better but now working in the media i can't no i can't i can't listen. be watching myself i can't hear my own voice like I hear my own voice come up if I turn on Foxtel, you know, it's a game that I've commentated on. Mm. Oh, like I can't listen to it. Yeah. It's like how am I working? How am I getting a job? That's how, what I'm thinking. Yeah. Bit of insecurity, mate. It is. It, but I, I think that's natural. Everyone needs it. Um, the media's a hard one. Like we have obviously great producers and, and you do too. But if I listen back to my own shows, I'd literally cut the whole thing out. <laughs> like I'd, I'd take out all my questions and just have you talking. Well, we, we do this thing at St Kilda before with um, Danny Frawley's daughter, Chelsea, and I said to her, don't worry, the producer, he'll polish it up later on. We'll yeah, look all right. Definitely. We'll look all oh, right. Oh, mate, the power of the edit. That's why, I, yeah. I, you know, you do live yeah. stuff. Well, I, nev- <laughs> I never, ever do live. Never. You can't hide there. You can't hide there. No. Um, speaking about leadership before, uh, never captain. Was that an aspiration for you? Yeah, it was. Um, I would have loved to have captained Richmond, you know. But looking back now, the timing was probably never right. And as I said before, I wasn't, I couldn't have been captain, you know, because of my own issues I had around probably some body language stuff and yeah. just things that I didn't control well on the ground. I mean, you can't have your leaders doing that. And I, underst- I understood that at the time, but I couldn't control it until I did that course that I told you about. So... Once I did that, I thought I could be captain, but there was just the timing wasn't right. And um, yeah, so I missed out. But yeah, probably is a little bit of a regret. As I said, I wish I controlled that stuff earlier. I might have then been captain of Richmond, who knows? With the, with the body language stuff, you don't mind going into into that. Like what was a what was the feeling around that? Was it like, how did it sort of come about? Was it something that was always in your game or did it yeah, just? Yeah, it was always a bit of white line fever that I had. Yeah. Uh, did you see him? Chatting to you today, the, like the person you're on the meet and the person I know, you're a very different person to like what is on the yeah. field and off the field. Yeah, I just had that white line fever. I wanted to play well. Like yeah. I, 
I hated not playing well. I yeah. couldn't handle not playing well. Wanted to be probably to a detriment, always wanted to try and be the best player on the ground and that just doesn't work in a team game and these days it's even more so. Um, so probably sometimes it was probably trying too hard to play well and then mm. it was disappointment at, at myself as much as my teammates. There was a lot of dissent towards teammates, there's yeah. no doubt about that, and umpires. So I wouldn't yeah. be able to play now, let's be honest. <laughs> you, you. <laughs> you wouldn't have any money. Yeah, so yeah, so look, it was just a combination of all of those things. And as I said, I did get it under control later in my career, but um, yeah, I was always that way as a kid, you know, I always spat the dummy a bit and I don't know why. I don't know where it comes from. I've never worked that out. Was there, t- we've worked backwards here, but was there a turning point that you went, fuck, I can't do this anymore? Like, was there a yeah. conversation had? Because did you get, was Danny for yeah, did he Danny, drop you? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't around Danny and I w- always thank him for that. He dropped me straight after. I reckon I'm, I reckon this is the quickest of players ever been dropped. Wow. So we played Carlton at the G on a Friday night and I had an absolute stinker. Oh, I've already beat you. I've been yeah. dropped at three quarters time before. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've, already, I've already beat you, yeah. Oh, you Sorry, that me. was me, yeah. Yeah, really? Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah, that's yeah good. it was when the sub was on and just like, you're not playing next week. I Did he like, really tell you that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you've beaten me. <laughs> yeah, no, good. I was like three quarter time, like done. Yeah. Like, you dropped. Yeah, so anyway, after this game, <laughs> I had a mare, I'd, Showed some dissent towards a young player, a guy we all love, Dave Roden. He's yep. in his second game. Yeah. And I, ha- I did a little handball over the top and Dave fumbled it and it went through for a point. Should have been a goal. And I lost it. And, you know, there was a few other things in that game that weren't right. And I was driving home to Fitzroy in my car after the game and the phone rang and it was Danny and he just went off his brain. Like I couldn't even understand what he was saying. But then the last little bit he said, and you won't be playing next week, you dropped. And that was probably when the penny dropped and when I started to, you know, search for some answers with it. Far out. What was the effect like with – was there a strong enough leadership group maybe at the time that pulled you up on these yeah, things as oh, well? Yeah, I mean it happened all the time. Yeah, but yeah. just it doesn't click until it clicks with you. Yeah, it did, it, I got told all the time and I knew it, you know. And look, it wasn't every game. You know, you look, yeah. at, you look at highlights on telly and it's – people would – the perception would be it was every game. You know, it wasn't every game, clearly. But it happened quite often. Yeah, leadership groups got me in and, you know, I tried and did a lot of, you know, I went and spoke to other people about it at, at times. But, yeah, just I never really was able to master it and, and get my, get a finger on it until my late 20s. It's a funny one as well because it's like what weakens us actually is our strength as yeah. well. Like if you're not in that mindset, yeah. you're not. Kicking well, bags, you're not playing well. Well, probably so now though that I would have been doing some meditation before yeah. the game. You know, you see players now doing all that stuff before a game, and that's probably what I needed. You know, I was probably hyping myself up, listening to you know music on the Walkman. It wouldn't have been the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I would have had some you know heavy music on, getting myself even more aroused into the game and my emotions up. Whereas I probably needed to go the other way, perhaps. Mm. Yeah, and come down. Yeah. I always thought that like if I was you know speak to young players again i was a bit the same in terms of like used to think that i had to be like a bit of rah, rah. people yeah, rah, rah. Yeah, yeah. and i just knew like as soon as i just like stopped that like i enjoyed the game i wasn't freaking out the whole time didn't have like this massive peak of energy and yeah. anxiety yeah and you just go out there and enjoy it yeah it, it actually is a lot easier exactly and that's been proven hasn't yeah. it recently with what a lot yeah. of the teams have done 100 percent um tigers obviously the, the success didn't come early enough yeah at, at, throughout your career was there ever a time when you thought you would leave? Uh, not really. Because at the time as well, like Richo Tigers, you know, still one of the biggest cult figures at that time. Like yeah. it was just huge. Yeah, look, I guess I guess I loved Richmond that much. I never really thought about it, you know. Um, there were a couple of instances where I think the club even thought about it. And I, I remember once under Danny... Um, there was a bit of talk around going to Hawthorne. Perhaps the club we were even thinking about maybe moving me on. Um, that was at the end of 2003. Um, I also spoke to Dennis Pagan once when he was coach of Carlton. Wow. Went out to his house. But I, I, in my own mind, I, I went out there to talk to Dennis because I respected what he'd done in the game. But driving away from there, I'm like, I couldn't leave Richmond. Once in the late 90s, Freo had a bit of a crack. But I never got to the point of even really talking about money or contracts with other clubs. And I guess the driving force behind it was always, if I left Richmond and they had a good year the next year and played in finals or had a good run and made a grand final, I just I wouldn't have been able to live with my decisions. Mm. So that was why I didn't do it, yeah. 
How did it feel when the Tigers started going well? Well, a lot of a lot of people have said to me, oh, you know, are you jealous of the success that they've had? It couldn't be – it's a polar opposite. Yeah. I couldn't be happier. You know, I'm a Richmond supporter and as soon as I finished playing, I went back to that supporter. You know, and I have to hide it when I'm doing Richmond games in the media. Some would say I don't. Um, I couldn't have been happier for the club and everyone involved in it because, you know, I had good friends – that was still involved, like Brendan Gale was the CEO, um, you know, guys that I'd played with and they'd started their career, like Jack Rewalt and Shane Edwards and Trent Cotchin. I didn't have a lot to do with their careers, but I played with them for a couple of years. So to see them get success was great. But just the club and the supporters more than anything, I was just happy for the Richmond Army. You mm. know, and there's so many of them. They've been so loyal for so long and to finally get there, I, I, you know, I, I think a lot of Richmond supporters, including myself, I'd blocked it out. I didn't think we were ever going to get there again. I didn't even think about it. I just thought it's never going to happen. So when it happened, it was just incredible. Just the best day I've ever had at the footy in, in any sort of capacity and um, to be able to be out there and be involved on the day and just see the emotion in all the, the Richmond supporters, that was what made it so good. I think like when you leave footy, you realise it's like got nothing to do with the players. It's all yeah. about the fans yeah. and you can understand – why they get so emotional yeah um it's literally their lives oh it like is it, it really is i mean you look at what happened here through COVID. i mean what what would it have been like without the footy on oh, you know yeah. sitting at home every night the footy was something to look forward to mm. and that's what we love about the game you know it, bring, it keeps people together it keeps them connected the passion it brings out the emotion you know that's what it's all about and without the fans there is no game anyway you know exactly. so that's what it is um a quick one on when you, you're finishing up your career, you obviously came through with a lot of good players. So Koch, Edwards, yeah. um, Rewalt, as you're saying, one, Alex Rance as well. Yeah. Who stands out from those guys and that you, know, that you just walked in the door and you went, fuck, these guys are ready to go? Or as, as yeah. even maybe some of them surprised you. Look, And then all... the last one, sorry, yeah. was when <laughs> we had Rancy on the show a while ago. And he told, I think he told one of his most embarrassing moments and it was when he was telling you to run through the cones at training. Yeah. I'd love to hear that from your... Word of mouth now. Yeah, well, that did happen. <laughs> I was pretty shocked at the time. But I probably, probably when I walked away, I thought, no, good on him, you know, like, yeah. He's competitive. <laughs> what can you set the scene of like what happened? Like, what sort of like Monday well, recovery? Was it a midweek session? Can I just say, firstly, my first impressions of Alex Rance? Yeah, please. just so before we get on to yeah, that. Yeah. So he'd been drafted as a high draft pick. I think he was a priority pick. So we got him over from Perth. And remember back then the older players like myself. So I was, I was a 14, 15 year player by this stage, right? So my body, I'm just hanging on anyway, yeah. right? So I've got a few extra weeks off. In fact, Terry Wallace gave me the whole pre-Christmas off in the last couple of years just so we could get through. So that's where I was at, right? So yeah. he's come across and his first day at training, they had all the draft picks out and they were doing run-throughs from the goal square to goal square. So what's that, 150 yeah. metres? Yep. And it was just meant to be some gentle run-throughs, you know, probably 70, 75%. Rancy had to win every one, didn't he, by 30 or 40 metres. And I remember I'd, I went down there just to have a look. I wasn't training. I was standing in the race and that was my first um, impressions of Rancy. I'm thinking, this guy, if he's, I don't know if he can play. Yeah. <laughs> But he's going to have a crack, right? And that's how he played his footy. He had a massive crack and then he ended up being one of the all-timers at the club. So then I come in and I finally rejoin training and they probably should have told the younger guys that I was just out there just to get through. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I didn't have to push through to the cones. I've done the Day hard one work. pre-season. I've, I've done yeah. my hard yeah. work. I'm just purely out there just to get a bit of run in my legs and just get through, not get injured is probably <laughs> what I was trying to do. Yeah. So we were doing some we we're probably doing some strides around the oval on the, the bend, right? Some two hundreds. And I was sort of running inside a few of the cones, probably to make them about one eighty just so I could yeah. get through. And Rancy screamed out at me to run around the cones. <laughs> and I was a bit taken aback. I'm like, did he is he really telling me to run around the cones? But in in fairness to Alex, they probably should have told him yeah. and just given him the heads up that I was just doing a modified program. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did the boys let him? I reckon some it? other guys were a bit shocked yeah. too. No one knew what to say. Yeah, no, mm. I can imagine that just would. Just but that like, sums him up. Right? It does, and that yeah. shows like why he had such an incredible career. Yeah, love it. Look, what about if you could have instilled that into every other player? You know, maybe we would have been a better team back then. Literally. Um, 
the other players anything stand out or even not like surprise in a bad way but surprised to how like one guy who is honestly one of the my favorite players yeah. like hands down shane edwards yeah but when he was so young to see what he's done now yeah. i'm like he just keeps getting better and better as he yeah. get like keeps yeah, going he does yeah well shane he hasn't su- well, he probably has surprised me a little bit yeah. how what he's been able to do. You know, he's going to be a three hundred gamer at the Richmond Footy Club. You know, joining only about five or six three guys flags. to have done that. Three, three fl- flags. Yeah. But when Shane got here, he he was seventeen, but he looked fifteen, right? Yeah. You know, some guys just look really, and his body, he seriously looked like a year nine or ten guy. He had no mass on at all, and he's still very slight now. Mm. But he always was elusive and you knew he had the skills. But, man, some of his first few games, I thought he was going to get killed. Like, I remember a game at Footy Park. I reckon Mark Rusciuto tackled him and I thought, he's not going to get up, yeah. right? That's, that's where he was at. So to see what he's done now, um, he hasn't surprised me, but um, just been a phenomenal player. Cochin, you knew, was going to be a gun. He trained at Richmond, um, you know, before he was even drafted. He was part of that academy and yeah. you know, we were down at um, – Middle Park doing like some some summer sort of training. We were doing beach flags, you know, where you've got to get up and agility and run and pick up the, the flag. And he won that and I thought he, the way he got up off the ground and was able to move, I thought this guy's got serious balance mm. and that's how he plays now. Um, you knew he was going to be a gun and Rewalt was always Rewalt, confident, um, sure of his ability, but then, you know, able to produce it on a Saturday and he was a high pick. So none of those guys disappointed, have they? Really? No, none of them, none at all. What about um? Uh, we we see a lot about Brendan Gale now, and like what he's been able to do. What's he like as you know a friend, someone that's close to you? What, yeah. In a sanctum of Brendan Gale, like it, just, it's an incredible, incredible story. Just a level head deal, I would say. Doesn't straight panic. away. Yeah, it doesn't panic and thinks things through. Doesn't doesn't make decisions um, quickly or or harshly. Goes away and actually thinks about what he's going to do mm. and that that's clear for all to see you know with that review richmond did at the end of 2016 Unreal. he's under serious pressure as a ceo right you know the media's coming if you weren't as strong a character as brendan you may have you know you may have jumped there you know dimmer had had seven or eight years it wasn't like he hadn't had a good chance to to make it work so yeah really level-headed but i had a personal experience with him once where oh, i do the pot at the club as i said and i'm in there every tuesday and I had some advice I wanted to ask of of, some, of Brendan. I knew he was someone to, as a sounding board to, to speak to. And I went and sort of spoke to him in, in his office and he didn't sort of say much. And I walked out of his office, I thought, shit, maybe he didn't, maybe he's too busy. He didn't sort of give me anything. Mm. And I thought, oh, I felt a bit funny. Maybe I shouldn't have sort of spoken to him about it. And anyway, about 24 hours later, the phone rang and it was Benny. So. And he gave me some advice and looking back now, it's been great advice. So I won't go into it, but that summed him up. So he went away, he thought about it and called me 24 hours later and gave me the advice. And yeah, that, that sums him up. Just a level head, thinks about things and yeah, thinks really clearly, I reckon I'd, I'd say. Uh, it was funny, like Rance says something that, you know, one of his best learnings from um, footy and, you know, maybe it, it comes from him as well is like the emotion – Versus logic, yeah, and being able to like separate that, and almost having a twenty-four hour rule yeah. around like things. Well, that, that sort of sums it up. Sums it? it up. Like for me, that's been biggest thing I always try and focus yeah. on in my personal life is like not reacting to yeah. shit on emotion, or, or even yeah. just giving advice if you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Yeah. Like just say I don't know. Yeah, exactly. You got to go away, and I reckon Benny went away and really thought about it and weighed it up, and just gave me the, the best advice. So mm. yeah, pretty good. good advice. How did you uh, go with towards the end of your career? Like, how were you feeling about ending up playing footy? Were you excited about it? Were you, you know... What, what? It came quickly. Um, so I had a pretty good year, my second last year in 2008 and had a good pre-season leading into 2009. I was 35 years of age. I, I felt good. And then, you know, I wasn't even thinking of finishing up at the start of that season. Um, but my hammy got a little bit sore after the round one game 2009, got a bit of tendonitis in my hammy and by round six I was cooked pulled it off the bone and that never played again when you kick your 800 yeah 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 so that was that was the end of it so it sort of came pretty quickly but i remember having the surgery on Mahami and got to the end of that season um dimmer came on board as coach to replace terry wallace at the end of that year 
Uh, I started the pre-season under Dimmer. Mahami started getting sore again, went and saw the surgeon. And he said, mate, you're going to need more surgery. You won't play till midway through the next year. And I'm like, that's going to be 12 months in between games, 35. I went and saw Dimmer and he said, no, nah, we're happy for you to hang around. But I thought, no, nah, that's it. And made the decision and felt like the weight of the world had come off my shoulders, to be honest. So I've never regretted it since. I was cooked. I knew I was cooked. Um, but then I had to find some jobs and I didn't really have a plan, just fell into fell into my lap a little bit, I think. Yeah. What was yeah. the what was the transition like? Did you do uh, like how did yeah, it all come Yeah, So well, when I did get injured, I, I rang my manager and said, Mate, I reckon we've got to work out a plan here. I don't think I'm gonna play again. And he said, I'll oh, wait and see, do the rehab. So we did it. But while while I was doing that, I did a few guest spots on 3RW, um, did a bit of the footy show when it was still going on Channel 9, mm. did a show with um, Robert Walls and Steve Quartermain on it was Channel One back then. It was like Channel Ten's yeah, digital yeah. channel or whatever. It was like a on the couch type of show. Did that a little bit while I was out injured and yeah, so cut my teeth a little bit there. And yeah, at the end of the year, I got some calls and was able to get the jobs once I retired. But yeah, you get thrown in the deep end. I had no idea what I was doing. What do you What do you love about the media now? Like what What do you? I just do love being involved in the game. Yeah. I still love watching the game. I love the players. I love watching the games. I don't like some of the nonsense in, during the week, the newsy stuff during mm. the week, like what's going on with Melbourne at the moment. Yeah. I don't really want to get involved in that. I just like doing the games and talking about the players. That's what I love about it. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm a bit the same. I think I had a chat with like a media personality, you know, years ago when I was sort of like trying to get started and I never wanted to get into like news yeah. breaking or anything like that. Yeah. And he said, you know, you're not going to go far unless you have an opinion. Yeah. I was like, I just don't think that's no. true. Like, So yeah. many people, other people have opinions. I, like, no. I just don't really think anyone gives a fuck about exactly. what I have to say. Like, and there's plenty of others that are going to give yeah. them, right? Yeah, we're not short of them. As long as you're being yourself as well. Authentic. I think there's no doubt that that's what you've got to be. If yeah. you're not being yourself, the people that are listening or watching, they know it. Yeah. And you're not going to last, I don't think. So. Do you have any other goals in the media? Like anything else you want to achieve or where uh, you want to get to? Like, Would you ever want to do like actual commentary or like, yeah, like, I've thought know, about call that. by call? I've thought about that doing what you know bt or, or james brayshaw does yeah probably probably not my go i yep. enjoy you know, sort of analyzing the game a little bit more I enjoy hosting things now yeah a little bit so maybe do a bit more hosting as we move along i'll tell yeah. you one funny story for just i just remembered from um that show with wolsey and, and <laughs> stephen quarter so it was a i had this stat and a few numbers on geelong and i'd come up with it myself and i'd chatted to a stats guy at Richmond who was still there and I said, mate, does this sort of wash this this stat and is it a good one? And he said, yeah, yeah, it is. And I said, I'm going to go with it on one week at a time. You know, I'd have thought like I had something yeah. good to bring to the table. So we're sitting in the green room. This is my first valuable lesson in the media. We're sitting in the green room before the show and Robert Walls was in there and Walsey had been my coach, you know, and I knew him well. And we're talking about the show and I said, well, was he in the first segment? You know, when Quarters introduces me, I'm going to go bang with this thing on Geelong, right? And Walsey goes, yeah, great, great, like it, like it. So Quarters comes on, welcome to One Week at a Time this week and we're joined by former Carlton Premiership coach, the great Robert Walsh. And what's Walsey done? Walsey's gone with my stat. No. <laughs> Straight off the top of the show, Walsey's gone with it. And I'm sitting there going, hang on. <laughs> So then I get introduced and I just had nothing. So if you've got any good stuff, keep it to yourself. That's, that is unforgivable. <laughs> yeah, Wolsey. And that's, we went to the ad break and Wolsey just looked at me and grinned. I thought... I feel like that's not out of character. Uh, yeah. 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 No, not happy with Whereas that. Whereas Bruce McAvaney, he gives you stuff to you. Yeah, yeah. But well, then you want to be that sort of teammate. Yeah. Like it was that. pretty funny in hindsight. But Fuck. Yeah. No, not for me. I don't have it. much good stuff, Dill. No, you got, plenty. you got plenty of good stuff. <laughs> what about um, on the boundary, like funniest sort of interaction with – I can imagine there'd be people hanging over the fence all day. Yeah. Does anything, like, is anything stand out that just shits you or people come up and you say each time? There was a guy in – there was a guy at Frio once at Subiaco and we were right on the boundary line and there was a lot of Frio supporters on the dugout um, sort of listening and we were – like appear to your sign away, like they were right there. So they could hear what I was talking about. So it was half time of a game and they were crossing down to me and we we're going to be talking about goal kicking and the fact that, you know, free I've missed some big chances. We had some vision of some real easy misses at goal. And um, 
this guy had watched the whole lead up. He'd watched us looking at the vision in the ad break and what we're going to talk about. And we come on live and I start talking about goal kicking and this bloke just starts spraying me about my own goal kicking, Yeah, right? I wasn't a great kicker goal. And he just had some really some good stuff around my percentages and my numbers and he just kept peppering me while I was trying to deliver it and then I just I lost it. I just burst into laughter and looked at him and it stuffed up the whole cross. Was it live? Yeah, it was live. Oh, my God. And I just – I had to turn around and just say well played to this guy. It was pretty good. Yeah. Oh, mate. That, that's one thing that sticks in my mind. Oh, they're always yelling out, but half the time you've got the earpiece in. Yeah. You know that they're saying funny you stuff. You just keep going. But you just got to plow through. Well, it's like you were saying before in play, so they don't read the newspaper. It's when even when you say, can you hear what's over the boundary line? Yeah. If you're walking up the boundary, you can always hear what people are yeah. saying. Yeah. Even though you try and pretend that yeah. you don't. Yeah, you and can. It's always there. Hey, um, mate, you've been so generous with your time. Last thing I want to touch on is – your love of music because this yeah. is this is super interesting. Yeah. Um, heavy metal. You love yeah. your metal? Heavy yeah, metal or metal? Is, it, is there a difference? Well, you've got different degrees of metal. Like I wouldn't say like death metal where yes. they're just sort of screaming and that yeah, really screamo. hard, fast guitars. So probably probably not to that extent, but stuff like, you know, I do like stuff like Metallica. I, yep. I love that early Metallica sort of sound. So plenty of that, but I can pretty much listen to anything. I wouldn't say that I'm just heavy metal yeah are you no. a vinyl guy yeah i love my vinyl yeah. yeah got got plenty of records in fact i got um a new record player recently and i had to go get an, a new amp for it and then my mate said i don't go buy a new amp i've got a really good old system and he gave me an old cd oh, player as well yeah and i've got like about six or seven hundred cds there so during covid i was whacking them out I, I could say i could listen to anything but Probably more stuff like out the driving, Queens of the Stone Age. Love a band called Faith No More. That's probably where the genre I love the most sits. Yeah, yeah. But I can listen to anything. Queens of the Stone Age reminds me of like Year Nine, Does just it? like <laughs> iTunes CD. Used to have that album on all the time. Um, are you into the Foo Fighters as well? Yeah, I love the Foo. Have you Fighters. seen the Foo Fighters doco? Yes. Yeah. One of the best things I've ever seen. Like he, I he, didn't realize how broke up, change over, how many people come in and out of the band. Yeah. He, he strikes me, Dave Grohl, as being a guy you'd love to meet. Yeah. You know, he seems like one of the good guys. Um, just on Metallica as well, true that you went to a live concert with Metallica taking one Brett to Lydio. I did. And you, I think you were front row, maybe just near the um, mosh pit. Yeah. And the whole mosh pit turned around and gave the Richo chant to you. It did happen, yeah. But the lights came on. So it was in between the, the support band and Metallica coming on. You know, they turned the house lights on. It was at Rod Laver. So it gets pretty bright in there and where we, myself and Brett were standing there and all the lads in the mosh pit who were my vintage, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my vintage sort of 40-year-old dudes with yeah. long hair. <laughs> Reliving our youth a little yeah. bit. So, yeah, they turned around and, and gave me a bit of a chant. I was pretty happy you with You know it. you're a big dog, especially in Melbourne and then in the middle industry when that's happening yeah. at, at a concert. No, it felt pretty good. And then the yeah. concert started. We had a good night. Yeah. yeah. Um, getting over to the US, seeing anyone, like who's sort of on the hit list? Have you got any trips planned? Ooh. Like what's happening? Yeah, I haven't been. I went to the States at the start of the year. Where do you go in the States? I've got a mate who has caddied on the PGA Tour over there for a long oh, time. Wow. Yeah, he's done a, he, cam, he caddied for Cam Smith actually yeah. recently, did a Is few Is he going tournaments. to the Open? Uh, no, he's not. No, he's not going to the Open this year. But, yeah, he, he's a good mate of mine from Melbourne. Um, Matthew Tritton, a great mate of mine, and he's, he's married to an American. So he lives in a place called Cardiff, which is in San Diego County, right yep. on the Pacific Ocean. So I get over there pretty much every year and, and stay with him and his family and just get away. It's a great yep. part of the world. Um, is that a live music sort of hub? Like, is there- Not really, no. If you want to get into the music, you'd probably head to, well, obviously Nashville. Nashville yeah. That is an amazing place. You don't have to, it's not just for country music either. It's got mm. all types of music uh, there. And Austin in Texas, yeah. if you want to get into some good music, head there. Um, yeah, so, and you go there and you just find bands that you love. You've never even heard of them, but there's so many different live places there every night. Yeah, honey, I'm going over the States at the end of the year and um, Nashville's on our, on our yeah. hit list, so yeah. I'll be hitting it up. Um, what's next for, for Richo? What do you want yeah. to achieve? Like, what's it, what is on the work? I just want to be a good dad now. Yeah. I've got three daughters, three daughters, so life's changed a bit. Yeah. Haven't and got as much how time. How recent is your latest one? I've got a three-week-old, wow. little, uh, little Ella. I've got a two-year-old next week in little Riley and Zoe's five in September, so... It's keeping me keeping me busy. Yeah, what's changed like the most around being a father? Well, I just I've got to worry about other people now. Yeah, 
You know, you get – mate, that's one thing. I was really probably selfish as a footballer. I think you've got to be at times. You do, as, an, as a professional yeah. athlete. I, sure. couldn't have, I couldn't have had a family when I played footy. I was too worried about, you know, my game and what I was doing. But um, so I timed it well. Didn't meet my wife until I retired. And a few months after that, I met her and, you know, I've got three kids now. So, yeah, life's a lot different. But, you know, it's – Probably more rewarding, I would say, than, mm. than footy and all of that. You know, watching these little girls grow up is pretty rewarding. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, mate, it's been incredible. Thank, Thank you so too. much for your time. You've got an incredible story and, and extremely generous. You're, you're a great man. I really appreciate it. And I think everyone's going to get a lot out of it. So thank you. Nah, thanks, mate. Thank it's you. It's been mate. fun. Cheers.